Hello, everybody. Welcome to day two of our 30 day challenge. Of course, I'm Bryce and I'm here with my friend Emmy, um, who is one of the other, uh, uh, I don't want to say sponsoring channels, participating challenge, we ch uh, channels. We should say, <laughs> y'all. Speech is challenging today. Right. This is very <laughs> challenging. I was telling Emmy, this might be kind of a, a harder conversation today because we are going to talk talk a little bit about the dark night of the soul and what that looks like. Um, but just some humor. I just got off with uh, Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa, where we also spoke a little bit about this. But so I'm very Vata. I'm, if you see my body, like I am so Vata. It's not even funny. I'm Vata Pitta. I don't have much kapha in me whatsoever. But the one kapha thing that I do have is my hair. I have very, very thick hair. I work very hard every day to straighten it so it does not look as thick as it is. Um, I have the propensity in the MISO room to come out looking like Albert Einstein because my hair is so thick. Um, and so I keep tr doing things to my hair to try to calm it down. And this morning I sprayed <laughs> after my shower, so much leave-in conditioner in my hair to make it smooth that it actually feels weird and it feels dirty. And so if you see me, I know I mess with my hair a lot, but if you see me messing with my hair, that's why. And unfortunately I had to jump on a show immediately. So I couldn't jump in and wash it out. But I know this is first world problems, but Lord have mercy. If anybody with thick hair knows how to manage thick hair, I, I'm still trying to figure it out at 39 years old. My mother used to, when I was really little, my mom would have to, when I would wash my hair and it was really long, my mom would have to put conditioner in my hair and then braid it wet. And then I would sleep with it so that she could actually brush through it the next day without me crying. Cause that's how thick it was and how knotted it would get. It's like the one of the, my dad has really thick hair. So that's like one thing I got from my dad. But, um, but yeah, my sister also has really thick hair too. So I, I, it's, you know, Grass is always green on the other side, right? I see people with thinner hair. I'm like, oh man, that'd be so easy to have hair like that. So, so anyway, anyway, so if you, if you're like me and you buy a leave-in conditioner, don't spray that much in it because it's going to end up feeling really dirty. So, um, um I can't relate. My hair, <laughs> my hair is very, very fine. I'm glad that it has curl to it because otherwise I would look like I have no hair. <laughs> My, you know, bless my niece's heart. My oldest niece, she has, my mother has very thin hair and my sister and I both got our dad's hair, thick hair. Um, my niece has very thin hair and it's, it's, she keeps trying to grow it out long and it's just not going to happen for her. So, but she's, she's such a beautiful little girl anyway. She's got that dark, her dad's family is Italian. So she's like the one kid in our family that has like the dark hair or the darker skin, but she's got these big blue eyes. And so she's beautiful. God knew what he was doing when he created her, but her hair, I mean, she's eight, so whatever, but bless her heart, that hair. <laughs> so anyway, um, it is day two of our challenge today, as I just said, and Emmy has been on this road for a while now. And so I said this yesterday in the video that I put out. When it comes to using exercise as a modality for healing, you never want to compare somebody's chapter 10 to your chapter one. And I really want people to understand that this is not a sporting competition. Of course, for me, I've been doing this for 16 years. So there's going to be a level of tolerance and a level of endurance and strength that I'm going to have in my practice at this point that this person starting now is not going to have. That's just science. That's just the way it is. But the, but the way I see it is that, especially in the spiritual world, is that my duty now as somebody who has been doing this for almost two decades is to be of service is to be that voice that's going to talk people off the ledge. That's what my teachers have done for me. And then one day in the future, for those watching that are starting now, you're going to be that person that's helping somebody else, you know, talk them off the ledge when they're having these moments, these come to Jesus moments, these dark night of the soul moments. Um, it's so much. And so it needs a little bit of head of everyone. And so she's hitting some, some obstacles now um, that aren't fun, are they? They're not fun, but it's necessary. It's the initiate's path. And I actually had a long conversation this morning with Todd about it, actually, about the initiate's path. And when you, when you take on something like this, you are asking 
for lessons and you're asking to change. And, and I think we have this um, romanticized view of what change looks like, like a Hollywood view of it, but it's actually, it's messy and it's hard. And sometimes it's the universe saying, how bad do you really want this? And the mm -hmm. person that perseveres and keeps pushing forward even if that pushing forward is them on the floor, literally crawling to their yoga mat, is the person that will eventually break through to the other side. And I wanted to kind of talk about that because I don't want you guys, when you hit these, these boulders, because sometimes they feel like boulders when you hit them, like they're immovable boulders. I don't want you to quit. I don't. And I love that people in, in our group are talking about, I can only do 10 minutes a day. Great. Perfect. 10 minutes more than you did a week ago. No practice is in vain. Even the practices, even the workouts, even the stuff that feels like shit and feels heavy, it's going into your bank of transformation. Right? Think this, about is, this is beautiful. So many of the things that you say go around in the circles of my recovery groups. Like Aww. what you just said, like, you know, you have to give it away to keep it. If you don't give it away, it stagnates within you and then you're going to lose what you've been given. So it's like, it's just such a beautiful flow. And then what you just said, and I, I'm, I'm an absolute emotional basket case today, guys, I will try to keep it together, but I don't know if you've seen my eyes get all watery when Bryce was saying it's not fun. Is it? No, I'm having a rough day, <laughs> but there's just, so much beauty in this. And um, like what Bryce was saying, I've, I've been doing shadow work for five years, but I have not explored the yogic path as of yet. And it's really humbling because you think that you're so far and you think that you've done um, so much work in your, and I have, I have done so much work. Yeah. I've come so far, but you think that you're, you know, on this level. And then you put yourself in a situation and you're just like that. And the law is so much to heal. Oh my God. And, and I will say, Emmy, so I actually was talking to Stephanie about you yesterday. Your ears might've been ringing. And I said, because Emmy is a friend of mine and she's been doing this before I even thought of doing the 30 day challenge. She was doing this. That's kind of why we started the series. And I'm going to validate for you uh, as a teacher who deals with hundreds of people a year going through this. You are approaching the work in Ashtanga yoga as somebody who already understands what the work is. And I see that in you. When I talk to you, you're accepting of all the, uh, cause sometimes being an Ashtanga teacher isn't fun because I have to, I have to, part of the role of an Ashtanga teacher is to kind of have tough love and it's, it's from a place of love. Because when a student's on the floor and they think they can't do it, and, and as a teacher, if I think they can't do it, I won't give them the posture to do it yet. I'll wait. But if I think they can, I have to hold their, I have to hold their foot to the fire and say, get up. Get up off the mat. Get up. Lean backwards. Catch your ankle. Do, catch your ankle. Like I have to be tough because I have to be that person that's holding them to show them that, that that path is open, right? And that's not fun to do because I am a very, I mean, I've probably cried more on my channel than have it. So um, I have invested in waterproof mascara, guys. So, um, um, and I am a very sensitive person. I am a very sensitive, I, I create a Hallmark commercials. Come on, like Christmas is coming up and all those Hallmark movies, you best believe I watch those all the time. And I cry and I cry. So when I see somebody who's struggling, there's a part of me, the friend in me wants to get on the mat and hug them and cry with them. But the teacher in me has to hold it back, be non emotional, to show them the path that they're going in is available to them, right? And it's not, it's not easy. It's not. And that's why a lot of people don't will run from the Ashtanga because it's not an easy path to take. And, but with you, Emmy, like I see that with you, it's you're easy for me to teach. You're super easy for me to teach because you ask me a question, I give you the answer and you go, okay. And you do it 
because you know you already know the wisdom behind the teachings and that's what we're, we're leaning on is and it's hard it's really hard like uh shanti and i were talking about this this morning and i kind of spoke about this yesterday the video with the anaerobic versus the aerobic and how we've been so programmed especially in the western world to how to look at exercise and for a lot of people i've been there i've been there where i've used exercise as a way to bully myself right i've been in that position where i've done too much because i'm trying to bully myself right and so that has to be course corrected and sometimes we feel so fragile as humans that when we get one little pain or one little sore muscle we run from the activity when in reality that's what's supposed to happen that's what's supposed to happen it's like those mental uh, modifications that um they talk about in the yoga sutras it's like e ego ego tries to steer you away from pain and toward pleasure but it's a computer program so something that may seem painful but will give you positive results in the long run is typically avoided you know you get get start doing this oh this hurts my body hurts i've been i've been in pain for six fucking weeks but I do it and I keep doing it because I'm seeing the results. I'm seeing the stuff coming up and breaking loose and coming out. I am, I have this bathroom scale and I know that I told you this before, but I'm just so amazed by this. I've been doing Ashtanga for six weeks. My bathroom scale is one of those kind that gives you other data, like percent body fat and percent water and pounds of muscle, pounds of bone, that kind of stuff. I don't know if it's accurate or not but it is consistent. It has send, said the same thing for the last two or three years. However, I've had long, I've had the scale. I've had like a hundred between 116 and 117 pounds of muscle and 6.2, 6.2 pounds of bone for three years. It said that in six weeks, I've went up to 121 pounds of muscle and 6.6 .6 pounds of bone. So I'm gaining muscle and I'm gaining bone and all this stuff is coming out and my postures are nowhere near perfect, but I keep doing it. Yeah. I keep doing it. I, I have certain days of the week that I have committed and I just keep showing up. It's like what I was told in my recovery programs, bring your body, your mind will follow. Just show up, just show up to your quiet time in the morning, show up to the meetings, show up to making phone calls just show up yeah and, and it'll and it'll happen I and love i think you, yeah, I love you shared ahead. that go ahead sorry no i i was done go ahead well i was going to talk about again about like well that's the anaerobic isn't it and i want to bring that back and kind of talk about this today because i've struggled with this i've been very open shanti and i um a few months ago did a video on body morphic disorder and I'll, I'll put that down in the description box below. I won't go through everything I went through with body morphic disorder. And this is why there's a, a great saying, and I love it, is be kind to everyone you don't know the battles they're facing. And I kind of spoke about this yesterday with Marnie Alton. We see Marnie Alton as someone who's a beautiful woman. She's very fit. But if you listen to her interviews, you see some of her struggles too. No one in this, no one gets out of this world alive. We all have our crosses to bear. And I have definitely in my life very much struggled with body morphic disorder, where I've literally thought I was the ugliest girl in the room and literally hated my body. And, and I know where that comes from. I know exactly where that comes from. I talk about it in the body morphic disorder video. I won't get into it here, but actually in this, um, in this signal group that we have going on, one of our friends asked this morning, Hey, cause I have for day two, you have to write five things you like about yourself. And so he said, Hey, why don't we all give something we like about ourselves? And it got me thinking for myself. And I realized that it, I'll be 40 in February. So I'm on the eve of turning 40. And I got kind of emotional myself because I, at this point in my life, I love my body. I'm at a point in my life through all my practices and really going up against that where I love putting on a bathing suit and going to the beach. And I wouldn't trade my body for the world at this point. But I had to go through all of that darkness and all that ugliness and with the aerobic and the anaerobic, I brought this up. So with aerobic, if we look at what's happening, scientific science and spirituality are really one and the same true science, not 
that science <laughs> that we have, but the, the real science, right? The real, and that's why back in our uh, Atlantean times, our ancestors, the priests were often also the scientists. God is science. And so if we look at what's happening with these forms of exercise, I was born in 1983. So I was born into a world of jazzercise that was really big in the 80s. Low fat diets were really big in the 80s and 90s. I remember going to my grandmother's house and she would have fat free cookies. Now we know that's terrible for you, but that's, that's the world that I was born into. And so even though I've never had a weight problem, I've had body image issues because of certain things that I was exposed to as a child. And in the 80s and 90s, Wow. We were kind of taught that we had to um, do all this cardio, run, do jazzercise, do all these kinds of things in order to perfect our body, in order to burn the calories, in order to have a bathing suit body. And so I think a lot of us, especially coming from the 80s and 90s, if you're 30s, 40s, 50s now, that idea is still ingrained in us. But now we know different because we know that aerobics – is actually going to put your body into fight or flight. And so the body is just scrambling for any energy it can. And it will actually slow the metabolism down. It will make you more hungry. So you're taking in food because your body literally thinks you're going into war, like physical war. And what happens after war? Famine. And so your body's, that's how incredible your body is. It's preparing for the next step. But what we see psychologically with women, especially women, I know it happens to men too, but a lot with women is they cling to the aerobics because they're trying to beat themselves up. And so it becomes this cycle of, of mental abuse where your body is swelling and inflamed from the intense cardio because that's what the body's gonna do because it thinks you're war, but you're beating yourself up because you see yourself as bloated and fat. You're getting hungrier and then you're denying that food because you don't wanna gain weight, right? And so it becomes this repetitive cycle. Well, what we see with anaerobic, the opposite of this is what the bar and the yoga is providing you with. And the anaerobic is basically, so what we do in Ashtanga yoga and what Marnie Alton teaches, the beginning of the practice of Ashtanga yoga, you're getting your heart rate up in the sun salutation. So that's the little peak of cardio. And we're doing just enough cardio to get the heart pumping, you get the blood flushing through the system, which is your prana. It's your life force. But then we pull it back and we have you hold positions. In bar, you're doing squats. And so that's going to bring your body into anaerobic. And so what is that? What do I mean by anaerobic? So that means that the, the body is now not using energy that's associated with the nervous system. So the nervous system can actually lean into the sensation versus being panicked into the sensation. And so the, it's able to drop into stored energy. Okay. So in aerobics, the body is trying to survive. So that's why you're getting hungrier. It's looking for these empty calories. And so it's not touching the cellulite. It's not touching that because it can't. It needs to hold the cellulite for when you're in famine after the war. Okay. I hope that makes sense. But the anaerobic, the nervous system can relax. And so it goes into the muscle development. And so instead of just grabbing for empty energy, empty calories, it's actually digging into held stored energy. So the physicality of that would be the fat, the cellulite, which the energetic is stuck emotions coming mm. with that. So the, the muscles carry information. So not only, so when you're in the squat, when you're in the yoga pose and the quads are on fire and the inner thigh is on fi fire, when you bring your attention to that fire, not only is your body in a physical way burning, taking fuel from stored energy, to harness the fire, but it's also pulling out stuck emotion too with that and then unsticking it. That's why bar and yoga are so effective for not only people usually lose a lot of weight doing bar and yoga. So anaerobic is the key to weight loss and slimming down, but it's also the physical activity that's going to give you the, um, the cause and effect you need in order to explore emotions because it's actually allowing your nervous system to dig into those emotions because the nervous system isn't in fight or flight. And I hope that makes sense. And again, and a lot brilliant explanation. Yeah. I loved it. That was awesome. And that's a hard pattern. I think for us, um, we're, we're close to the same age. I mean, I think for a lot of us who are born in the late seventies, eighties, nineties, and we, we have already a set patterning in our head 
that in order to lose weight, we got to go run 20 miles a day mm-hmm. or do the aerobics. And there are, there is some aerobics in this, in this challenge, but I, I, I only scheduled it at certain times. Most personal trainers who know this will tell you only do cardio once a week for your heart. And then the rest of it needs to be anaerobic. Yeah. And so if, if that's something that people are struggling with, I want you to ask yourself, like if you're, your body doesn't know you're on a treadmill, you know, you're on a treadmill, but your body doesn't, your body literally thinks you're running for your life. Right? So what are you running? If, if you are so in the cardio, what are you actually running from? What are you running from? I used to be a runner. I was addicted to running. And my body was so inflamed when I was a runner. Oh my God, was my body inflamed. I didn't know how inflamed my body was until I started yoga from the running. Because we get used to the pain. We get used to, oh, I'm swollen. We we sometimes confuse inflation with being bloated. When your body is literally telling you, I'm in war right now. I got to store fat and food because we're going to go into famine after this. When you're not. You know this, but your body doesn't. That's how amazing your body is that it can do that. So let's think about that. Let's think about that from the positive perspective. Our bodies are such incredible machinery that if we were to go, I mean, we are in a war, but it's an information war. But if we were to literally have to go into a physical war, like our ancestors did, our body knows how to do that. Our body knows how to store food away, hold on to it while you're physically fighting because it knows that once that's over, you're going to go into starvation or famine. So it's preparing you for that, for that dark night of winter. Now that we know this, it's like backbending. Backbending is really challenging for a lot of people in yoga because we have more nerve endings on the front of our chest. Why do we have more nerve endings on the front of our chest? Because in tribal times, a spear might fly over a wall And we need to learn how to cover and actually cover our vital organs. And so when you're asked to do a back bend, not only are you opening up hurt emotion, but you're also being asked to open up nerve endings that instinctually, by design of nature, you want to cover. And the minute I've studied that with the nervous system, that changed my back bending. Because when I started to go back and I felt that panic, I was able to breathe into it. Because no spear was coming for me in the yoga room. Nobody was going to hurt me. So I, had, I then had the opportunity in that moment of friction to calm the fire down. It's okay. I did the same thing, Bryce. I'm just going to scale it back a little, a a lot because I am nowhere near backbending. My heart space needs so much work, you guys. So one of the things that Bryce had me do was take, take a a long towel or a, a, what do you call them? The the bands that they use? Uh, I I call them a lungi because that's what we use in India, but you can use like, um, I'm seeing if I have a robe, like a belt for a robe. Yeah, that, yeah, or that. a scarf, a long yeah. scarf. Yeah. So you, you take the scarf and you put your hands on the end and straight arms and you go back with it. No and bent elbows. Forward. Yeah. No, no bent elbows. Keep your arms straight. I couldn't do it. With my arms as stretched as far apart as I could on this scarf, I couldn't do it. And I kept working at it, kept working. I'd get to like about here, kept working at it. Well, now I can go up and back and up and back with straight arms at the end. So I'm making progress, but I tell you what, so much fear was coming up when I would get to this spot like this. And I'd be like, hell is, what, what is this? So I was like, nothing's going to happen. Why am I so afraid of stretching my chest? Like, so I just breathed into it. I just, I was like, I'm safe. I'm fine. There's nobody here. That's going to hurt me. Um, what is my deal? And as soon as I leaned into that fear and and just was completely confident that I was safe and there was nothing that was going to happen to me, I was able to go back into the stretch. And, and now I can go back and forth and ba- back and forth, um, no problem. But there was a huge rock there, obstacle. I, I just, it, it was 
Yeah, it was it's crazy. Nerves. And and when you when yeah. you Google, that's part of the, the the opportunity too. You have like when you first start doing this exercise, using exercise as a modality for healing. When you hit the hard parts, you panic. Like that's your mm-hmm. that's everyone's first experience is to panic and run away. Um, and the more and more and more you bring yourself to the level of discomfort needed, the more you can like calmly go into the discomfort. And so like Stephanie can't join us today because she's, she can't get to the, the it's a long story. She'll tell you when on our next, our next uh, episode, but you know, she's been doing Mysore and I always tell people like when you go into a Mysore room and you see someone who's been practicing for a really long time, like if you were to see me practice right now, after 16 years, my practice is pretty clean and I get very focused. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but I've been doing it for so long that I'm able to now enter into hard parts of my practice with a calm mind, right? That's the power of this practice is that the, 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 the hesitation, the discomfort is there. It's still there in different ways. Of course, the body opens and changes. So it just comes in different forms, the, the deeper you get, but I'm able to approach it in a very calm way because I've gone through the, the not, I've gone through the panic. I punched a fucking teacher coming out of a back bend. Like I, how, how much fast that can you get, you know, there, you know? And so I've, I've been through that flailing on my mat, like a fish out of water flop shop, hot mess express, everything. I've been through it. And through that, I learned, I had to learn through my own experience that the obstacles are going to come, whether I'm prepared or not, they're going to come. Same in life. The obstacles are going to come. The action is never going to change. The only thing that I have control of is my reaction to the action. And it's so much easier if I can come at an obstacle with being calm, with a calm mind, a focused mind, than coming to the obstacle frantic and like a, like a flop shop and a shit show. And, and so you start to see that on, on your mat too. That's another area where the practice becomes an exercise for life. Because as you start to be able to work through these triggering postures, all of a sudden, when something in your real life happens that's hard, your perception of that action changes. And the way that you greet that action, you welcome it. As Shanti says, you just welcome it. You know, let's talk about some of the hardest things anybody can go through. A divorce, heartbreaking. Doesn't mean you're not going to feel the pain of the divorce. You're not going to cry. But you're able to perceive it in a different way. As a moment in time. That's offering you an opportunity to learn and grow. The pain is still going to be there because pain is real. And that's what's needed to bring you to that next level of awareness and understanding. Everything in life then becomes a practice. Everything in life, because the whole point of life is for the soul to know itself. The point of life isn't to come here and win the rosebush contest in your neighborhood and have the best you know, Christmas tree at Christmas time and be the best accountant and have, you know, a Harvard education. That's not the point of life. The point of life is to know yourself, to know. And I said this too, and I want to reiterate this. I think sometimes in the West, we think that spirituality is, you know, the divination and the talking to other spirits. No, it's not. Spirituality is knowing your own spirit, knowing your own soul. And that runs through your fascia. That runs through to the tips of every toe. There's so much information there and it is going to be, it, it's, it is going to come away. I've told you this, Emmy, it comes in waves. And usually when, you, when you're where, where Emmy is and you're literally feel like you're pushing up against a boulder and everything hurts and you're in that dark night of the soul, it doesn't feel like you're going to come out the other side. It just feels like you're kind of stuck. But from my experience in my own body and from the hundreds of students I've taught over the year, that's usually what happens right before breakthrough. It's always darkest before the dawn. And mm-hmm. so I don't want, that's the last point in your practice you should ever be quitting. Because let's see what happens. This is where it gets, int- this is what I keep saying. This is where it gets, where Emmy is right now mm-hmm. is where it's interesting. Interesting. This is the plot twist. This is the plot twist. Let's watch. 
what's going to happen. She, I don't know what her breakthrough is going to be. That's the surprise. She doesn't know what her breakthrough is going to be. But one day it's going to happen. She's going to either wake up one morning and all of a sudden um, a ton of weight's going to have dropped off or she's going to get on our mat. And all of a sudden she'll do that back then with no problem, with no pain. Uh, I, I I don't think Todd will mind me telling this story. Um, when Todd first started going to India, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. This was when he had just finished school. He was a photographer. And this was in, let's see, he's 11 years older than me. So this was probably the mid 90s. So before the internet was in everyone's houses and all that kind of stuff. And he was already kind of interested in esoteric stuff and he was always kind of the weird kid. He was a skateboarder, you know, he's covered in tattoos, you know, he was always kind of a little bit different. So he was already interested in, in spirituality and all that kind of stuff. He was a photographer and artist and he would have people bring in um, magazines to give him inspiration for what they wanted out of the photography se uh, session. And someone brought in a details magazine and there was in the magazine was an article about Patabi Joyce. Now the person wasn't paying attention. They had other pictures for Todd, but Todd ended up discovering this article and he read it and he was like, so interested in this yoga, this teacher in India. And so at the end of the article, it had a list of teachers in America that were students of Patabi Joyce if you wanted to practice with one of them. And one of them was Tim Miller who lives in San Diego, California. Todd was living in Georgia at the time. And so Todd literally went to the phone book, looked up Tim Miller's phone number and called him on, you know, the actual no cell phone. Tim Miller answered. And Todd was like, I want to study. He's like, Todd was like, I don't want to study with you. I want to go to India and study with this Indian guy that I just read an article on. And Tim said, okay, here's the address. You just write him a letter to tell him you want to study with him. And so Todd wrote a letter mailed it to India. And he said for like six months, he would run to the mailbox and check to see if he could. He never got a letter back. But in the meantime, in the meantime, he had bought a book on yoga. And so he was trying to teach himself some yoga before he went to India. But six months later, he hadn't heard back from Batavi Joy. So he called him again. He said, I sent him a letter. It's been six months. I haven't heard back. And Tim said, oh, you, you won't hear back. You just have to go now. He's waiting for you. And so this like 22 year old kid, he ended up selling all of his photography equipment. Mind you, this is what he was doing for a living. He sold all of his photography equipment, everything to be able to afford to go to India. And at that point he said, you landed in Bangalore. There was no uh, carriage for your suitcases. They just dumped them all with a bunch of chickens running around. You had to kind of dig through and find your suitcases, get in a rickshaw, go four hours into Mysore. They dropped him off at this house in Lakshmi Puram and Todd just kind of knocks on the door and Amma, his Patabi Joyce's wife, answered. She goes, oh yes, you come, you come. Well, apparently Patabi Joyce was napping at the time and so Todd had to go upstairs and wake him up. His first meeting was to like wake him up to pay him. Well, over time, you know, Todd's practicing. This is his first time with a teacher. He's the youngest one there. And everybody is getting a kick out of the fact that the older students, that Todd did not have a teacher in America, that he literally bought a book and taught himself some stuff and then came to India because that just wasn't heard of. People went and studied with an American teacher first and then went to India and Todd just went straight to India. And they were encouraging him to tell Guruji, like, this is hysterical. Go tell Guruji. And so Todd got the courage and was at one night because they would go to their house at night and talk with them. And, you know, there wasn't many students. So you could do that. And he said, you know, I, they want me to tell you that I, I learned this because of a book. And Todd said, Guruji got so mad all of a sudden. He was like, book learning incorrect. You have to have teacher book learning incorrect. And so Todd was like, oh shit. And so for weeks after this, Guruji was on top of Todd, cranking him in every single posture making him do things over and over and over again, like really pushing him. Todd said he felt like that he was trying to get him to quit and he never quit. And then Todd said one day he woke up and he was extremely sick, had a really high fever. Stuff was coming out of his mouth and the other end. Just y'all, we've all been there. And so Todd went and checked himself into an Ayurvedic clinic. 
And he spent 24 hours in the Ayurveda clinic. They gave him fluids. That was it. And then they sent him on his way. And so Todd was going back home and he lived right beside the Joyce's. His house was right beside. And Guruji was sitting outside and he saw Todd walking down the street. He goes, you, why you know today? Like, why didn't you come today? Why you know today? And as Todd got closer to Guruji, Guruji saw Todd and he goes, oh, complete revolution. That's what he said. He's seen that Todd had had a complete. And Todd said, I've been at the Ayurvedic clinic, very, very sick. And Guruji said, correct. Any medicine? And Todd said, no, just fluids. And he said, Guruji said, correct. After that, when Todd came back the next day, it was a totally different ball game. He had proven himself to Guruji. And Todd said, after that happened, he all of a sudden dropped like 20 pounds in two weeks. All of a sudden, his practice got really easy. All of a sudden, he was flying through primary series. No big deal. Guruji had a level of respect for him that he had never seen before because Todd stuck with it, proved himself. And, um, and Todd said when he finished primary series, he was all excited because he all of a sudden was doing primary series, no pain, super easy. And he was walking past um, Guruji and he was like, Guruji, no pain, primary series. And he said, Guru Guruji laughed, chuckled and said, oh, tomorrow's second series, much pain coming. <laughs> <laughs> much pain coming. <laughs> And then he started on a second series. And, and that, that started Todd and Guruji. I mean, Guruji, he could never say, there was only like 12 students at that time. So he really got to know his students. And um, Todd, he could never say the name Todd for some reason. So he just called him Charles. He could be like, T -t 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 Charles. Um, the first time in a backbend that Todd had to catch his ankles coming back and Sharat was assisting, who's my teacher now since Guruji has passed away. And Sharat, he, he heard Guruji say something to Sharat in Canada and Sharat goes, okay. And he went to Todd and he was, we have to do these windups and he grabbed Todd's arm and Todd said in a moment, he realized that Sharat was going to make him catch his ankles. And that is a huge deep backbend. And Todd said just something instinctual just came out and he just yelled, no, really, really <laughs> loud. And, you're, and the teacher's like head is right beside you when you're doing this. And Shirat just whispered in Todd's ears, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so um, got it. But it was that instinctual, like Guruji knew it was time. Um, in between Todd's first and second trip, uh, he came back for a few months and then he was going to go back to India. And so he was practicing and he went to a class and he thought, I'll just go to this class. And he had never had an American teacher before. So he didn't know what to expect. And he got a bad adjustment and it popped his hip out when he was really injured. And when he went to India the next time he told Guruji, when he saw him, I, I well, actually, no, he didn't say anything. It was just when he was practicing, Guruji noticed, he goes, Oh, a painting. They, they, painting they say that in india p-a-i pain and then they add the i-n-g at the end i love it painting like it's hurting and todd said yes bad bad adjustment and guruji said oh no worries fixing well todd said whenever guruji would say fixing your heart would hit your stomach it was a gut punch because outside of the shala they would call it a yoga surgery like you were about to have a yoga surgery basically his fixing meant he was going to fix it but it was going to be rough and so Todd, he just, Guruji knew instinctually which posture he had been injured in. It was Upavishta Kodasana. And so every day for weeks, Guruji was shorter. He was like 5'2". And he was like, he like crawls on you. And Todd said he would like crawl on him and adjust him and do all these things and move his body and figure it out. And then Todd said one day, the planets must have been aligned for Todd <laughs> that day. He was in Upavishta Kodasana with his legs are spread apart, hands are at his feet and his chest is going to go to the floor. And he said, Guruji came behind him, put his knees on his thighs and put his chest against Todd's back. And he whispered in Todd's, Todd's ear, you go. And he pushed him all the way to the floor. And Todd said his thigh, his hip popped so loud that Todd popped back up again. Guruji fell off of Todd, started laughing and said, oh, bad man, bad man, just started, ho, 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 started laughing. At the end of Todd's practice, as he was leaving the shala, Guruji said, you come tomorrow. You come tomorrow. So Guruji knew 
that Todd was going to wake up in pain tomorrow. And sure enough, Todd said he woke up in pain the next day. Now, Todd lived right beside the Joyce's. And so Todd said if he was late, Guruji would just yell up at the window. You come to, to Todd because he was right there. <laughs> but he came in the next morning and he was in a lot of pain. He got through his sun salutations and Guruji came to him and said, you go take rest now. Go home. All he wanted to do was to come in and do the sun salutations that next day to flush the hip. Todd is 50 years old now. Ever since that happened, he has never had a hip problem since. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened in that room with Patabi Joyce that hurt so bad, removed whatever karma was there and popped it right back into place. And it has since has never been that again. And that's the power of this practice. Um, there's more story. People can tell you so many stories. Um, there was a woman who um, lost her period. And that is serious for women. I, that happened to me once in this practice. You know, that's our barometer of health. And, and in, in yoga, we want to respect that. And she told Guruji, like, I haven't had my period. And Guruji just said, no worries. Or it's fixing. No worries. And he made her do some yoga postures and he adjusted her and her period started. That's how powerful the body is, the power of adjustments and the power of allowing yourself to be the student and to be at the mercy of, I'm not telling you to go out there and find some haphazard teacher. You know, you got to trust the teacher before you allow yourself to be vulnerable. But in that trust, even when things are painful, you know that once you break through the other side, you break through the other side. And the body is going to respond. I mean, the first story I told overnight, it totally changed him. His body changed. He went from being kind of a chubby kid to having a six pack. Because it released something about the pressure Guruji was putting him on every single day. The pain, the pain, the pain. Um, something then just broke free and released. And left him. And he had to go to the Ayurvedic hospital. And he was shitting all day. <laughs> but uh, it released. Literally, it released, you know, and so that's those are all there's so many stories like this. I mean, I shared about when I broke my sacrum and the pain I went through with that. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because now my sacrum is the strong it is it has ever been. You know, they, these are just stories that people have, you know, the word guru means to transmute darkness to light. Every single person is a guru has a guru inside of them. But you can't find that guru until you go to a guru. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about a cult leader. There's a difference. There's a difference between a cult leader and a guru. A guru is not. My teacher in India has no idea where we're living. He doesn't. I have to find my own apartment. He doesn't keep up with us. He doesn't tell us what to eat or anything like that. We just go in and do our classes and leave like a school. Right? That's a, that's a teacher. That's not a cult leader. You know, um, and so once you find an actual master teacher, or guru, you then are, have the ability to find the guru inside of you. And that's also too, and this morning we were talking about this, that the path of finding that inner guru is the initiate's path into spirituality. And it's not going to be easy. There's going to be many times where the universe is going to come up and say, you sure you want to do this? I'm going to challenge you right now. Are you sure you want to keep going? And more and more things, different obstacles are going to appear. You know, and that's, that's, that's the friction. That's, that's what you signed up for. And so with that being said, like, I don't want to scare anybody because it's such a beautiful process. Once you lean into the process, once you lean into, it's like the more, the more your heart breaks, the more the light can come through. Mm -hmm. If you have an ugly cried, with snot coming out of your nose, with your pants on, your yoga pants on backwards, and your hair looking like Albert Einstein at 4.30 in the morning, then just wait, it's coming. And those, those days when it's 4.30 in the morning and your yoga pants are on backwards, and you got snot coming out of your nose, and you're ugly crying, your hair looks like Albert Einstein, when you look back on your process, those are the most beautiful times. It's not the days when you're, you've got the beautiful Lululemon outfits on and your hair is braided beautifully and you're floating through your practice. Those aren't the practices you remember. Those aren't the practices where there's transformation. It's the ones that are messy mm -hmm. and ugly. 
and you got smells coming off of you you didn't even <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Bryce I don't think I've ever stunk so bad in my life I I'm telling you, it's brutal <laughs> I, I, I told Stephanie I was like this is why I have a set of yoga clothes that I practice in and a set of yoga clothes that I teach in and I have smelled the most foul smells coming off of students but you get used to it and you just keep going and I am telling you right now, romantically, I will never practice in front of a partner. Mm -hmm. I won't do it. Well, first of all, that's my time. It's got nothing to do with them. And I think if we can see it that way, at that time, that's just, it's just you and God. It's all it is. If you leave your partner out of it, then you're taking care of yourself. And you can be more, you know... <laughs> About to say something inappropriate. I guess I'll say it anyway. The moves I learn in yoga, I can use later. But <laughs> ah, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, but but during the moment when I'm, you know, if it's four o'clock in the morning. That kitchen's mine. You can't come in. That's my my kitchen is my shala. My kitchen. I practice. It's not fancy. I practice in front of the refrigerator with a dog bowl right there. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's my, that's where I practice. And that's my time. That is my time. And that's why I was, exp I don't know if it was you, I was talking to this about Emmy or someone else about the yoga mat. You know, I'm very particular. And a lot of people who have been practicing for a long time, my yoga mat is my yoga mat. I will not, I know my, if you, I could have a ton of black mats. I know which one's mine. And it becomes very, even though we shouldn't be attached to it, it's got all my prana on it. It's, it's like undergarments. Yeah. You, don't, you don't share your underwear with people, you know? No. <laughs> you don't share your, your no. yoga. <laughs> and I never I, I know this sounds gross. I'm a, actually a very clean person. I shower twice a day, you know, but, but my yoga mat, I only clean my yoga mat when I come back from India. Other than that, I let it get grimy because it's my grime. It's my grime. It's my prana. It's my grit that's on that mat. And my teacher too, because my teacher and in, in, in uh, you know in India, like in Ashtanga, I know it's some of the vinyasa flow world. They're like, don't step on each other's mats. No, you can walk on each other's mats. I walk on other, you know, especially in India, the mats are so close together, you can't help but overlap your mat sometimes. But but that's 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 my sweat. I had a mat once that I the back of it I rubbed through my feet. There were holes in the back of it, and I got my second manduka. And I thought about framing that mat, just putting it in a big old frame. Because that mat had been everywhere with me. That mat had been around the world with me. Those footprints were mine. That was like my, my treaded path. You know, and that's something to be proud of. Like when you go through this dark night of the soul, when you go through this, when you allow yourself to be put in that pressure cooker and you come out the other side, be proud of yourself for what you did. It's not easy. If it were easy, everyone would do it. If it were easy, we wouldn't be in the world predicament we're in now because everyone would be doing it. It's not easy. It's not. Um, it, I, I had this, I, my birthdays are really hard. I have a really hard time with my birthday. Um, I'll have a moment of vulnerability here because I always thought that I would have children. And I've never had the opportunity to have children. And I'm going to be 40. And so... Now, I know with the flip of the timeline, that's going to be a possibility. But in the matrix we're in now, it might not be a possibility for me. And the last birthday, I'm always, I am always seem to be in India over my birthday. It, I think it was like my 37th birthday. I was, or my 36th. Some, one of my late 30s, I was coming up to my birthday in India. And I was having like that pity party of panic. Like I'm getting older. I'm not in a place where I can have a child. I really thought I would have, well, I love children. I would love to be pregnant. I would love to have a baby. It hasn't happened yet. I don't know if it's going to happen. So I was having this like pity party. And then I was in my practice in the, in the shala. And all of a sudden there's this big famous orange wall because orange is a, the color of the monks. And so they paint a wall orange. And, and I was in the shala and I, I turned and transitioned and I kind of you know, saw the wall that I see every day. It's always there. And then something hit me really, really, really hard. Yeah, I don't have kids. I don't have the white picket fence and the carpooling and all that stuff that I always wanted. But look at where I am. 
I'm in the most sought after yoga shala in the world. I'm in um, 2000 people apply within the first five minutes and only like 300 to 500 get accepted. And I immediately got accepted. This, so this is the alternative and this is amazing. And that's my baby is to be able to now return around and give this back to other people. You know, that's my baby. That's my contribution right now to humanity. It's not to produce another human, which I would love to do, but it's to, to bring this teaching, continue to bring this teaching to the West because it is, it is a powerful teaching and to whom much is given, much is expected. Um, Todd always told me, and this was true, that you never want to be the student that sits at the guru's feet. You always want to be the student at the back of the room that gets called to the guru's feet. And when I first went, to, first got accepted into KPJYI, and I was going to take on Sharat, I knew who Sharat was. It's because in the yoga world, he's like the top celebrity, right? Because he's the main Param guru. I knew who he was. He didn't know who I was. I was just a new student that got accepted. And so many students go there and they grovel for attention from Sharat. You see their egos start to, you know, they want, they want validation. And I had already done a lot of work on myself before I went to India with David Greek, my original teacher. And so I made it a point that I was going to be very, very aware of that with myself. Like I was going to, I wasn't going to try to like get Sharat's attention. I was, I was just going to be me. I was just going to be a student and be me and see what happened. I wasn't going to lionize Sharat. And about the second month into my time being there, uh, we have these cards that they put at, you put the base of your class card that you put the base of your mat. Everybody has one. It has your whole schedule on it. And he was working with me. And I saw him bend down and like, look at my card, he examined my card for a minute. I thought, oh shit, is, does he think I'm in the wrong class? Like, but he didn't say anything. He just looked at my card and he went on to the next student. Well, the next day I was sitting in the lobby waiting because in, in, in India, you have to be called in because there's so many people. You can't just go in to be called. So I was in the lobby waiting and I heard Sharat scream, Bris, you come. And I heard it again, Bris, you come. And my friend, my Russian friend, roommate, was sitting beside me, like hit my arm. And he was like, Sharat's talking to you. And I was like, oh, because B-R-I-C-E is, is French, it's Brice. But in, in America, we say Bryce, but I didn't register that. And so I went in and he had, he, he had a spot for me. And I realized at that point, he doesn't, you know, if he doesn't consider, if you're just kind of there and he, he'll call you like the fat Russian or the tight German, like he never... He won't learn your name. He only learns your name if he considers you your, his student. And so at that moment, I realized that he now considered me his student. Mm -hmm. And it was such a, a humble, because I had not tried. I just went there just to learn. And it was such a lesson for me, a, humble, a humbling lesson that the more we stay humble in this practice, the more the practice is going to open itself to you. And you always have to remember that no teacher is going to give you that validation. They're just there to give you the tutelage. So you find the validation. So you find that within you. Over the years, I've gotten closer to Sharat because of the Mysore Foundation. And I've been back multiple, obviously, I, he authorized me, you know? And so I do have an established relationship with him as my teacher, as my teacher. I wouldn't ask him nutrition. I probably wouldn't go to him about marital advice or anything like that. Some people do, you know, but just as my teacher and to hear his perspective. But I also know, He's coming from a different culture than I am. He makes fun of us in the West because we don't have arranged marriages. And so he's like, oh, my Western students come in, new partner every four years. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Indian students, one partner whole life. It's because it's arranged. And he's like, he doesn't. But so I understand there's a different culture there. Like I would listen if my parents picked my fucking husband. I would not be sitting here on YouTube right now. I probably would have already like ran, ran off by now because we have very, my parents and I have a very different perception of, of what I'm attracted to. <laughs> they would have picked for me and I'm very stubborn. If I'm not attracted to you, there's no way you're getting any loving from me. Like that's just not gonna, that would have been a very dead marriage. So, um, so, you know, but I laugh at that because he's funny when he, and he can do a full on American accent, you know, um, so I laugh at it. He makes fun of us too. You know, like in India, they do the head bobble. And my Indian friends have tried to teach me 
what different head bobbles mean, but to me, they all look the same. But when you're in India, you start to kind of do it because you're talking to so, and you just kind of start to bobble your head back when they're talking to you and Sharat will bobble at you. So you kind of like bobble back. And this one day in conference, uh, a kid from Miami, I say kid, he's like a 40 year old, but a kid from Miami raised his hand, asked a question. And Shrat answered it. And Shrat goes, is that good enough? And the kid bobbled his head. And Shrat goes, you, you will pull your neck out. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> us Indians have been doing that since we were born. You Americans never bobble your head. You were going to pull your neck out doing that. And tomorrow you're going to come in to do a sun salutation. And you're going to be like this. Because you <laughs> <pulled your head." laughs> so he has a sense of humor about that. You know, he has a sense of humor about the different cultures. And I see it too. Like, you know, I'm never going to go to him for marital advice because he's in an arranged, he loves his wife, but it's a very different culture. I want to be passionately in love with my husband. <laughs> I don't want to be arranged to him. You know, that's just not, that's not the romance that I dreamed about as a little girl, you know? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it can be funny. It, it can be funny, you know, about, um, you know, he, uh, he, at one point, he, uh, I'll say this too, in India, one of the biggest problems that as women, we face it as white women, I'll say that we face in India is being groped. So it, especially in South India, it's very um, conservative, more so than the South of the United States. And they can't even like hold hands or do PDA in public. And so and it's all arranged marriages. So there's a lot of, of, of boundaries when it comes to that. So what they do, the guys watch a lot of P-O-R-N, right? Of course they do. And most of the P-O, that's a trigger word on YouTube, guys, so I'm spelling it. So a lot of P-O-R-N that they watch involves white people. And so they see us white women in our yoga pants early in the morning, and they think that that's what we do. And so they'll drive by on a scooter and they'll, I've been groped. Um, and so what Sharat does, one, one time it got so bad that he actually provided us with sticks so we could whack <laughs> as they drove by. And then he paid what they call bakshish, which is like bribery for the cops to start monitoring that area in the morning to keep us safe. I was telling Stephanie this story though, that um, one time when I got grabbed in the boob, I was walking home for practice and I was like a hot mess. Like I was not looking like a POR and star. Let me just tell you that. Like I was looking like Albert Einstein, like no, no casting director would have ever hired me in this moment. And my <laughs> boobs were sweaty and I was gross and I was, my mind was on my practice and I was walking back home and a scooter went by and someone grabbed my boob. And I remember I didn't even react. I was like, well, that sucks for them. My boobs really sweaty. Like, I just remember, like <laughs> you, I got the last laugh there. Like, you guys just grabbed a really sweaty boob. Like, that's disgusting. Like, I don't even want to grab my own boobs right now. They're so sweaty. <laughs> so, you know, but I was just so unfazed by it. And and that's, but that's, that's a, you know, but Sherat will try to protect it. At one point, it got so bad that he made sure that every female student had a male student pick her up on a scooter or walk with her to the shala because he didn't want any of the females by themselves at that moment. So he's very considerate of the cultural stuff like that. All of, awesome. And all of that, I was telling Stephanie this, you know, all of these stories from India, when you embark on the spiritual practice, not only does the practice get hard, but your life starts to get a little bit crunchy too, a little bit staticky too, because stuff is coming up in you and what's coming up is going to attract that outside mm -hmm. of you to mirror it so that you can really really work through it it's not to punish you it's not to put you in a place to turn you away from the practice it's going okay these issues are coming up now so let's work on them in your actual life away from the practice the practice is giving you the opportunity to observe now let's work on them in your life and so i really want to express that if, if stuff starts to get hard that's why we have the support group on signal Emmy and I are, are available. Just, just say, I need help. I need a shoulder to cry on. I need someone to talk me off the ledge right now, you know? And that's what, because it, it's, it, it's, and if it gets that way, then yay. In a really fucked up way. Yay. <laughs>
<laughs> you did something right because something is presenting itself to you. And I don't know if you want to speak more on that, Amy, about, about the life side of this as well. Yes, I, I would love to. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll go back a little bit and even include some of my Reiki attunements. When I would get, okay, and, and this applies because exercise changes your vibration, whether it's yoga, bar, any kind of energetic uh, movement like that is going to change your vibration. So when I would do my Reiki classes, um, and I didn't notice this until after like my third class, um, I didn't make a connection. I noticed it, but I didn't make a connection as to what it was, but for like a week after I would get attuned to new Reiki energies, my husband would be a total dick. And I'm like, I could not figure it out. Well, I finally, finally asked one of my teachers and I was like, why does my husband turn into such an asshole after I get attuned to new Reiki energies? And they're like, oh, honey, because you're raising your vibration and his is not in harmony with yours. And it takes a few days to level it out. And I'm like, Oh, it makes so much sense. This morning, I'm doing my yoga practice. I had some kind of emotional something break loose, and I'm just ugly crying on my mat while doing my poses, mind you. It so does not look anything like what you think it looks no. like. It, it just doesn't, okay? So I'm continuing to do it, and I'm gently talking to myself, just keep going, Emmy, Emmy. and and I, I was arguing with myself in my head, just going back and forth, back and forth, and I'm like, would you just stop challenging me and just do it? And so I just went as far as I could, and then I noticed today in, in homeschooling, my little guy, my seven-year-old, constantly arguing with me, constantly wanting to change this. I want to do this first. No, I want to do that first. I want to do this first. And I'm like, would you just, and I'm like, it's my yoga. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I did something, released something, raised something, and he is out of a tune with my energy. And he is arguing with me and fighting with me because our vibrations don't match. Yep. So just look for that in your life, like in animals too. When, when you're, when you're, when you have a sudden change, like a breakthrough or a Reiki attunement or any kind of energetic level up, and you're just out of harmony because you're in harmony with everybody in your home, yeah. you will, it's called entrainment. You know, our, our heart fields can extend up to 20 feet. And so when we're in a room of people, we entrain them to our energy. And so, you know, your, your whole household is used to a certain level. When, when you level yourself up, nobody's vibing with you and it's chaotic and people can act like my husband did like a jerk, you know, and, and it just took us a while. Now what we do, if I, if I have a new class or, or do something, we're aware of it. And we can, you know, make precautions for a few days and be like, and if something comes up or if something erupts, we're like, oh, it's just because our energies don't match. And then, you know, go in separate rooms and it's whatever. Um, but yes, I'm glad that you brought that up because when your energy changes, it can cause things to happen yeah. in your home life, your work life with people in the grocery store, you know, whatever. And knowledge is power and knowledge protects. So knowing that being prepared for that is going to help this transition be a lot smoother. I know a lot of people though will embark on a spiritual journey and they end up divorced because it can't mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're on two different paths. You know, you marry someone and you're going in one trajectory, but you, you decide to take another path and they don't come with you. And I, I you know, you do what you have to do in your life, but I just wanted to, to say that, that if you decide that it's, it can't work. That's okay too. That's okay too. It's all up to you. It's all up to what you feel like you need to do in your journey. Um, you know, and, and, uh, most, I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, for me, when I pick romantic partners, I'm looking for, I, I've always looked for spiritual people. That's why I always date poor guys. <laughs> I'm always like looking for the ones who's going to sell everything and go to India, <laughs> so, you know, uh, but, but that's some people want, you know, uh, financial security, some people want, but I always wanted spiritual security, you know, and that's, and that's okay. And that's, that's fine, you know, but, but you, you just ride the wave, just ride the wave as it comes. 
don't try to force the wave. And if you know, my favorite thing, one of my favorite sayings is when you don't know what to do, do nothing. Wait for the answer to come. The answer will come. But the friction is beautiful. Now, all right, you guys, let's talk about, you know, we've been on about an hour now. So I want to go ahead and talk about day three, because the last two days, you guys have done the same uh, exercises. And today we're doing, or uh, tomorrow you're doing Ashtanga for the first time. And so let me pull up the challenge here for you guys to see day three. This will be posted on the community tab later. So Thursday, November 3rd, day three, you have a choice. You can either do 20 minute beginner Ashtanga with Ashtanga nurse. I love this guy. He's a fellow, a peer of mine, uh, an authorized teacher. There's the link. Or you can do the gap guide to have primary series with Ashtanga nurse. Here's the link. This is about six. It takes about 60 minutes to get through the half primary series with him. Now, Emmy, you've been doing half primary series. I will also put in the, the description box me teaching Stephanie and Emmy half primary series. It goes a little bit slower than his because his is just him doing it very cleanly. Now, somebody new to this might see half primary series and think, oh, that's going to be really easy. <laughs> You want to talk about the half primary series, Emmy? <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I, I am so out of shape. Like I'm not out of shape. I've exercised almost my whole life. I exercised through all seven of my pregnancies. You know, I, I have, I've had a food addiction issue. So my weight has been up and down, but even when I was heavy, I've always exercised. I've not done a stronger. It is kicking my ass. Um, I will be honest with you guys. I have such a hard time even getting through sun salutations and the foundational standing exercises. I am ready to quit before I even get to primary series. Okay. It is so difficult for me. And, you know, not everybody's going to have that issue. Like you were saying in other videos, Bryce, sometimes people, um, sometimes people don't have their stuff come out until they're in second series or, or after, you know, that was me. My stuff didn't come out. Actually, I keep talking. I mean, I'm going to pull this up because the 20 minute um, Ashtanga beginners is the sun salutations and fundamental sequence. And so I wanted to bring that up because I don't want, um, I don't want people to jump into the half primary thinking it's going to be easy and then get discouraged. Yeah, um, because it's so hard. And I just I love Ashtanga nurse so much. Like he he's such a calm presence that he really I has. Love, the right yeah, his videos with his um his little the baby. Oh, my gosh. So, so cute. I love them. So let me so this is the 20 minute. Let me make sure I've got the volume off so we don't get copyright. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I put him up. I could have very easily done this to my own videos, but I really like like this teacher and so i wanted to support him that's why i put him up instead of myself with this sorry it's playing an ad guys we don't get to pick the ads do we i mean they just put them on so um <laughs> so and here we go here's another one um so the, the 20 minute ashtanga uh, morning flow for beginners this is just going to be the sun salutations and the fundamental sequence which is what starts off all the series and so this is a great place to start for people who are super new to Ashtanga yoga, like he's got the Ashtanga body. You see that long lean body? That's because he's doing anaerobic stuff, right? So um, that's the typical Ashtanga body uh, for men and women, very, very thin, very long lean muscles. So he's doing the opening chant and then he's going to be doing, going through the sun salutations here. Um, you see how in Ashtanga, our downward dogs are closer together because what, what he's doing right now is warming up the serratus interior muscle, which is going to be coming in the jump back, jump through series, which you're not going to do if you do the 20 minutes, but I'm just letting you know that's why it's a little bit different. Um, let's see here. Let's go here. Let's see. So he's going to, he's going to be showing you, this is a very clean practice. As I said, this is why I did this with um, Emmy and Stephanie. So clean practices are what's expected of people like, him and me, because we're teachers, right? We've been doing this for years. So um, don't expect your practice to look like this, to be able to jump back like that, right? That is what we are expected to do. Not a beginner. Just step back. 
right? And I want you to, I, so when we do these demos, like this would be considered in the yoga world a demo, yeah? Is showing what the cleanliness looks like. So he's going to take you through the sun salutations, Siri Namaskar A and Siri Namaskar B. And then he's going to take you through the standing sequence, okay? I think. Yeah, here we go, standing sequence. So he's doing the standing sequence here. So this is just the foundations of the asana practice. So if you're new to yoga, I would suggest that you just do the 20 minutes. Okay? And that's what you work with for now, is just the 20 minutes. Yeah? That's it. And then as time goes on and your body opens up and you get stronger, then we start to work and he's going to do the three closing postures and then he's going to have you take rest and that's it, right? Okay, here's the guided half primary series. So this is the um, the half primary series where you actually get into the seated, the seated series. So he's going to take you through all the fundamentals. I love how he's doing this while, as the sun's coming up because that's what it's normally like. He's going to be taking you in through the seated series. And the seated series is where you have all the jump backs and all the jump throughs. And so if you're not used to doing that, it's a lot. It's a lot to be able to do the jump backs and jump throughs, especially if you're new, especially if you are uh, not familiar with Ashtanga yoga. If you're used to vinyasa flow, vinyasa flow ain't yoga. Let's remember that vinyasa flow is not yoga. It's yoga size. It's a bastardization of the real yoga. Okay. This is the yoga that's coming from the yoga Karanta. That's thousands and thousands of years old. Yeah. And so if you watch this jump back, jump through, this is what you're going to be doing a lot. It's a lot. So with that being said, tomorrow, if you get on the mat and you're thinking that the half primary series is going to be something that you can do and it becomes difficult, I don't want you to get discouraged. This takes a really long time. He's going to have you do the back bends too here. If you uh, jump back, uh, drop back, stand up, that's not something I expect any beginners to do. This takes years to be able to do this. And there is a sequencing. If you want to learn how to jump back, jump, or do a drop back, stand up, you need a teacher to help you do this. Okay? You need a teacher to help you do this. This is one of the things you have to learn to do to get into second series. You see how he's walking his hands closer to his ankles? That's because eventually he's going to be catching his ankles. That's that story of with Todd I told you where he was like, no, and Sherrod said, yes. See, he's walking in. A beginner is not going to be doing this. This takes years, years to be able to do. The full closing sequence is not, I don't expect beginners to do the full closing sequence at all. I want you to hurt yourself, right? Um, so you'll, after you do, if you do do up to Navasana, you'll come and you'll just do the three closing. The, you skip through that and just do the three closing. That's all you need to do. Don't overwhelm yourself because if you are, and we'll have Stephanie later this week talking about her experience in Mysore um, and what Mysore is like uh, because you're not expected to do all of that. It. You will be stuck at half primary series doing that for years before you're given the next posture in the middle of second. Because the middle of primary series is where you're starting to put your legs behind your head. So it takes a while, okay? So if, if the half primary series, let's go back to the challenge again. If the half primary series is too much for you, then you just do the 20 minutes, all right? And then you'll have your questions. And then Friday, you'll either do 20 minutes Again, with Ashtanga Nurse, or 30-minute bar with Marnie Alton, or both. Or I give you the option to do both of them. Yeah? And then Friday, Saturday is your, your rest day. Okay? So don't overwhelm yourself. Uh, anything you want to share with him about expect the unexpected with Ashtanga Yoga? Mm. <laughs> yeah, just, just be present. Just show up and be present. Don't have, try not to have any expectations. Try not to have any expectations. I know that we do have expectations, but just try to like set them aside um, because it really does not look like what you think it's going to look like. And and it was exciting for me the first few times that I, when I started the workout, the nitty gritty stuff doesn't really come until you do it. And, th and this, I have so much respect for this path doing the same movements, putting your body in the same positions, 
really brings stuff up. It really brings stuff up. So if you're fighting with yourself and you're having a hard time holding a position, just notice it. Just observe it. Just witness it. Don't try to change it. Don't try to tell yourself you're not doing it right or you're never going to get this or you're not capable or you're not able or you're don't don't do any of that try or try not to when you do do it when you do do it do do <laughs> when you do when you do do that just okay this is what i'm doing and just observe it like, like meditation interesting that's how i reacted when i hit this hard asana interesting. Hard. interesting 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 i tried to beat myself up there are a couple of advanced postures in the first half of primary series, especially John Ushershasana C and Marie Chasana D. Those are advanced postures. In the, it's the primary series because it's yoga chikitsa. It's physical therapy. That's why it's primary. Not because it's easy, but because it's physical therapy. The point of the first series is to get you to lose weight, to tone your body up, to get the physical gross body in shape. So when you go to second series, which is nerve therapy, you're physically prepared to take on the nerve therapy, which we call the batshit crazy series, because that's when people are really crying in the corner. You know, so <laughs> so that's so that's the only reason why this series comes first, guys. It's not because it's easier per se. The second series is harder, but in a different way. Yeah. So please, if, if the half primary is too much for you, you just do the 20 minutes. It's enough to do the 20 minutes and don't beat yourself up. You just say, interesting. I thought I get that all the time. I thought I actually, the cynical side of me, kind of the bitch in me, we all have that side of us. When I get these men that come to my class, they're like, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I do CrossFit. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You do CrossFit. <laughs> CrossFit, that's so cute. <laughs> Welcome to the real work. I had this guy that came to me all the time. And I knew I was told from another student that he was coming to me because he had a crush on me, which I don't date my students. So um I was like, well, tough, tough shit for him. He's taking the wrong path. But I was so hard on him, I ended up becoming like his personal trainer. Like he was like, that girl's a ball buster. You want to get fit? And, and that's it. I, he was my student for years before he moved because he lost a shit ton of weight. All of a sudden, all he was doing was yoga. He wasn't doing any more of the gym stuff. Um, so, you know, whatever gets people in the room, gets them in the room, you know, but once they're <laughs> in the room, they're all yours. Now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I, we have people all the time come to AYA to the beginner course. Cause I used to run the beginner courses and we would have husbands and wives come and the husbands would be there with their wives because their wives thought this would be a fun date night experience. And after the six weeks was over, the wife would leave and the husband would stay. <laughs> Cause he was like, this shit's hard, you know? And that's why <laughs> like real yoga you see. And when you do Ashtanga, you see that this practice was created by men for men. Cause there's a lot of upper body strength in it. It's very masculine. This practice is very masculine. And most most Ashtanga teachers are men, straight men. I've always had male teachers. I do better with male teachers, actually. I do way better with male teachers. Um, the female teachers are my friends. The male teachers are my teachers. Um, you know, and it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it will kick your ass. It, that's why Ashtanga is the most humbling thing you will ever do. Um, as a teacher myself, I have to go back to India every 18 months now, which is different now with the whole lockdown situation, but just in general, because I have to continue te practicing in order to be able to teach. So I have to continue having my ass, ass handed to me in order to be able to ha hand your ass to you. That's how serious this is, you know, how seriously they take it. And so if you want to, you know, if, you're, if your husband thinks he's a macho man, it's so funny. <laughs> Guys crack me up. People are like, yeah, I do rowing. I'm like, darling, that's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
let me get my hands on you. I will make you cry. <laughs> I will make you cry. <laughs> so, um, oh, but can you pick your own? I mean, you saw what I mean. And it's, I, I will admit, it is sexy to see a man with a clean yoga practice, to see a man like a, a Ashtanga nurse who is very, when you hear him talking, he's very calm. He's a great dad. You see the yoga in him and that's sexy. That is sexy to see a man that has dedicated himself to that. You know, the world would be a better place if more men in the Western world did this. For sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. But all right, guys, I know we've been, we've gone over an hour now, but let us know, let any of you know down in the comment section below how you guys are doing and there's anything that we can help you with. Um, if you have any funny moments during, oh, some people said their kids are doing it with them and their kids are actually so awesome. Saying their son is like a soccer player was like, this shit's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one last funny story before we we sign out so i what used to be director of yoga for wellness centers of america so i was responsible for the whole yoga program and all the different locations hiring all the teachers all that kind of stuff but my day was i taught a lot of the class most of the classes at one location i taught to and i spent my day in yoga clothes because that's what i did um not a bad job, right? And I have this one guy because in this center we had chiropractic, yoga, nutrition, massage therapy. It was like one big center. And I had my office near the front desk and I would I always was they would chit chat with the girls at the front desk. I, I loved working there. I'm still really good friends with all the people I worked with there. And this one guy would come for massage and he would see me every day. He would come and he'd be like I need to know how to get a body like yours. And I said, well, you do yoga. He was like, no, but how do you do that? I was like, you do yoga. You want a yoga body? You do yoga. No, but like, what can I do in the gym? Dude. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you do yoga. That's how you get that. You do yoga. So yes. So if more, if more Western men actually did this practice, I think the world would be a way better place. <laughs> it, would call, it would take definitely take the male ego down, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I mean, yeah, it's it is so humbling, but so addicting. It it I love it. I and I'm so grateful to be doing this in at this time. I'm I'm glad that I have been through what I've already been through. And doing yoga now. If I would have tried this before, I don't. I don't. I re- I highly doubt I would have stuck with it. It comes to you when it's supposed to come to you. David yes. Green used to call it like Willy Wonka's golden ticket. Like if you find the Ashtanga practice, you found the golden ticket. But it comes. It's like ayahuasca. They say ayahuasca mm-hmm. calls to you. The plant calls to you. It's been calling to me for years now. Um, I was actually supposed to go to Dieta in Peru right before lockdown happened. Uh, I was more afraid of that going for 10 days to Peru to do Dieta than I have ever been about going to India. So um, <laughs> and then lockdown happened, but the Ashtanga practice is the same way. The lineage yoga will come to you when it's time. It's medicine. This is, we call your practice, your prescription. This is your mm-hmm. medicine, right? Mm-hmm. The opening chant. You're calling to the jungle doctor, what they say, the jungle doctor, to remove your poisons. Those are your attachments. Those are your mental attachments. Those are your your boulders that you're going to hit against. You're asking to have them removed. You're consenting to clear that pathway between you and God, that your own ego, the soul, your soul knows who you are. Your ego is what's convincing you of what you aren't. Mm -hmm. And that's the battle that you're facing right now is going up against your, it's the story of Hanuman. Oh, to that one last story before we sign off from the Ramayana. Ramayana Ram marries his wife, Sita. Beautiful woman. And Ravana, who is the 10 headed demon who lives on Sri Lanka, steals Sita and takes her away. And Ram is just, So out of sorts, he can't find his wife, his beautiful wife. So he hires Hanuman, who is the monkey warrior god. Hanuman is associated with Mars, the planet Mars, also Tuesday. Now, in the the process, Hanuman's father is Vayu, the wind, the breath. 
and Hanuman has these powers, but like us, Hanuman kind of goes through like amnesia and forgets that he has these powers. But Rob hires Hanuman because he's such a great warrior to go and find Sita. And when he realizes that Sita is being held in Sri Lanka with Ravana, the ten-headed demon that can't be slain, he remembers all of a sudden that he has these abilities. So he jumps all the way from India to Sri Lanka. And he finds Sita. He finds where she is. And instead of just sneaking her out to Ram, he knows if he sneaks her off the island and takes her off, Ravana will just come get her again. So he knows that he has to man up. And he has to go up against the ten-headed demon, Ravana, that can't be slain in order to bring Sita back to Ram. I won't go into the details of what he does. You'll have to read the Ramayana. But he ends up defeating Ravana. And he brings Sita back to Ram. Well, what is this story really about? Ram is God. Sita is your soul. Always makes you emotional. Ravana, the ten-headed demon who can't be slain. You cut one head off and another one grows back. That's your ego. Hanuman, the son of Vayu of your breath, is your courage. It takes courage to go up against your ego so that you can return your soul to God. But you are Hanuman. You are all of those things. You are Sita, you are Ravana, and you are Hanuman. And that, that, hunt, that element of Hanuman, that's why I love one of the kids in the slums gave me this little Hanuman that I hang in my car. It's hanging in my car. It's this cheap little Hanuman. It's been hanging at my rear view window for years now to remind me. That's why Hanuman is so important, the monkey god. Because that's your courage. It takes courage to, to remember who you are. You're not Ravana. You're not your ego. You're a child of the most high and you have abilities in you. And you'll ne you're never going to find that courage. You're never going to find that, that divinity within you unless you take the chance to return your soul to, to go up against Ravana. You can't do it sitting on the couch, wa eating popcorn, watching the movie, guys. No. Not going to happen. That's why I keep saying you're the storm. You're Hanuman. You're Hanuman. You're Hanuman. And you're Sita. And you're Ravana, but you think you're Ravana. Ravana the ten has convinced you this is who you are, but it's not who you are. You're Sita and Hanuman, and you're returning yourself back to Ram. So you guys got this. And you're going to have to go to war. That's why Hanuman's the, the monkey god of war. He's the warrior. That's why Mars is associated with Hanuman in Tuesday, the day Tuesday. But you are a warrior. That's why you came to Earth. So you guys got that? Got this? You're all, we have almost, I forgot to say this. I was going to say this at the beginning. We have almost 500 people now. So. Oh my gosh. Awesome. So, Should have said that at the beginning. But, <laughs> but uh, there we go. Um, it's never too late to start. So please keep sending me those emails, guys. It's just a template. You can shift the days. It's no big deal. Send me the email. I created this for you guys. You take it and run with it. It's yours. So, so you guys are doing great. To whom much is given, much is expected. So take what you've learned, pass it on to somebody else, and keep moving forward, guys. Right? We didn't come this far to only come this far. Amen. All right, guys. We love you, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.